Ansari designed this humorous cartoon to illustrate the process, in this case his experience creating a new language arts book. The process required him to go through all previous textbooks on the language arts, noting every subject covered, and create their new book from that information. Right off you can see one key problem. There is no original research or verification of the facts already in the existing books. Errors and bias are thus perpetuated from generation to generation. The material in the past textbooks is distilled into an outline for a new one. The editor doing this has to keep in mind two powerful public forces textbook manufacturers contend with, Texas Christians and California liberals, labeled F. Staff, or freelance writers for the publishers, not scholars mind you, write the books. Save Texas and to an extent California, the curriculum guidelines of all other states, K, are ignored. Let's return to Ansari's article for further explanation. When it comes to setting the agenda for textbook publishing, only the 22 states that have a formal adoption process count. The other 28 are irrelevant, even though they include populist giants like New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, because they allow all publishers to come in and market programs directly to local school districts. Among the adoption states, Texas, California, and Florida have unrivaled clout, but in this elite trio, Texas rules. Texas Christians attack the books for not adhering to their conservative agenda. California liberals for a perceived lack of social justice. Texas is important, Ansari explains, because here we encounter the gabbler legacy. The gabblers were conservative Christians who became experts at influencing the textbook review process. Thanks to their detailed instruction manuals, today evangelical Christians across the country make similar attempts. Hindus can learn from their approach how to influence the adoption process. See, for example, this helpful flowchart of the adoption process at their website at www.textbookreviews.org. They have issues with just about all the school textbooks, biology, math, English literature, etc. For world history, they have a particular goal, which is to prevent stereotypes of whites as oppressors and people of color as victims. Specifically, they want it said that British rule brought peace in a common language, English, to deeply divided India, ended or opposed suti infanticide and child marriage there, improved Indian health, education, and transportation systems, and merely added another caste to the already existing system. I would hazard to guess that no one at this conference knew evangelical Christians advocated this historically dubious slant on the British rule of India. I certainly did not. The editor P fixes the objections raised by the Texas Christians and California liberals, the process of minor adjustments we witnessed in California. Ansari writes, Concerning California is normally of the politically correct sort. Objections, for example, to such perceived gaffes as using the word Indian instead of Native American. To make the list in California, books must be scrupulously stereotype-free. No textbook can show African Americans playing sports, Asians using computers, or women taking care of children. Of course, these are not the concerns that Hindus raised in California, but it is useful to understand what the board normally hears. And the book is released upon the unsuspecting student Q, who believes it is scholastically sound and unbiased. As we saw in California, the highly political process does not guarantee such results. No one involved, not the publisher, not the editor, not the writers, not even the Texas Christians or California liberals are experts in the subjects. So how does this work out in practice? Here's one of the books submitted to the state of California in the 2005-2006 adoption process. It is published by the prestigious Oxford University Press. On this page is the statement, But not everyone in South Asia is Hindu. Some, like most Nepalese, are Buddhists. In fact, the Nepalese are 81% Hindu. Now how did such a wrong statement get in the book? Just look at this list of acknowledgments. The National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Geographic Society, Smithsonian Institution, Harvard University, and the credentials of the authors. Jonathan Mark Kinoyer, Professor of Anthropology, born and raised in India no less, speaking several South Indian languages, 
Ronald Mellor, professor of history at UCLA, Amanda Pondani, professor of history at Cal Poly. How could these people let through such an obvious error? Did they even read the book? But there is a clue here, the fourth author, Kimberly Houston, a writer of historical fiction. One conclusion we could draw is that she actually wrote the book, based on her own limited knowledge. The weighty academic credentials of others associated with the book gave it unwarranted prestige. This book, by the way, was the only one actually rejected by California for its many errors and disrespectful attitude toward Hinduism. It was, we heard, later allowed in through a backdoor appeal by the authors who promised to fix the more obvious errors. Such lists of academics are common in the textbooks and meant to intimidate anyone challenging them. Here's four pages at the beginning of one. The two authors, professors of history, a list of editors and consultants, advisors and reviewers, test teachers and more reviewers, a grand total of 54 experts. None of this guarantees accurate or fair material appears in the books. The teachers know this, the schools know it, the Department of Education knows it, only parents and students are in the dark. Those in education are not surprised when complaints come up over the textbooks. We know what Real Academic Review does. At a meeting during the Hindu Collective Initiative in Orlando, Florida in December 2007, a session discussed this second history lesson to be published by Hinduism Today. Dr. Bade Chowdhury advocated it be prominently endorsed by qualified academics. We took his advice, resulting in the listing of six academics on the first page. It was no easy matter getting their approval. I spent weeks working through every word of the lesson with Dr. Bajpai and weeks more going through the comments and corrections of seven more academics and several community leaders. So what is presented in this lesson is academically sound, more so than the common textbook. How might we make use of this new lesson? First, action items at the personal level. Obviously, study it yourself. There is much you will learn. Second, teach it to your own children. Third, incorporate it into existing temple teaching programs and summer camps. A set of lesson plans for teachers is under development and will be available at www.hinduismtoday.com slash education slash. Second level of action items, approach your local school. Find out when your local school teaches history from 300 to 1100 CE, usually about seventh grade and convince the school that India has been slighted. If your kids are in the school, the principal or the board will hear you out. Go to the Gabbler's website for advice on exactly how to deal with schools. Propose their youth in advanced placement or AP classes at the high school level. Teachers who are innovative are searching for just this type of material ignored elsewhere in the curriculum. Even college classes can use it. One professor made the first lesson required reading for his college course on India and Hinduism. We've been advised, but have no experience with it, that homeschooling programs may be open to using our material. These simple lessons are excellent PR material to educate your community. Third, action items at the state level. HEMAC at its conference last year initiated a range of actions to change the teaching of Hinduism in public schools. Other speakers will also touch on this. The actions included use of the first Hinduism Today history lesson. We have to date distributed 40,000 copies in print, including 13,000 to one UK group. 15,000 copies have been downloaded as PDF files from our website. Downloads continue at a consistent rate of 30 a day. That's not many considering the millions of school children. We need more community involvement with this school textbook issue. It is critical to the future of Hindus in the United States. Provide the schools with better material, including these lessons. The schools have money to purchase supplemental material and are more likely to use it if they buy it. You have to convince them it is needed. Work at the state level to get the curriculums revised for the teaching of Hinduism and Indian history. Next time the textbooks come up for review in Texas and California, both about 2012, be prepared. It is a 20-year process to get the books changed. We've just started. Fortunately for California, a new Board of Education rule requires beginning in 2009 that all books up for review be posted online. Those involved in the last round faced a major problem just getting a hold of the books. 
Draft plans for our own National Curriculum Review Institute to vet every school textbook published, just like the Muslims and Jews have done. Finally, Hinduism Today's Action Plan for the Future. Chapter 1 was printed in 2007. Chapter 2 in 2008. And in 2009, we intend to produce the third lesson in our series, this one covering the Muslim domination of India from 1100 to 1800. These were centuries of war and destruction, repeated sacking of temples and coercive attempts to convert Hindus. And yet, through this same period, there was a great religious power generated by saints, such as Andal on our tentative cover, which allowed Hinduism to survive during a period when the religions of other countries totally succumbed to Islam. It was this spiritual strength which allows us to thrive today at more than a billion strong.